You're alive. <laughs> Does that mean I can hear you talking and saying that you're alive? I guess so. Okay. It just and says live at the top. I guess that's all that matters. <laughs> yes. So, anyway, this is an experiment. This is only a test. <laughs> this is a test. Uh, we don't know how it's going to work out. We've never done it. So we're attempting to go live from Ratio Christie at Marshall and see how it works. If anybody watches, if they don't watch, and if there are any comments following. Actually, we had one of our students leave to say he was going to watch it live instead of a team. So maybe he's smart. <laughs> I don't know. But the topic he's is the reliability of the Bible. Uh, we've had this a few times. But tonight we're going to try to make it as short, sweet, and to the point as possible. So since we're talking about the Bible, let's at least start with a definition. Apologetics is focused on definition of terms. If we're going to talk to somebody, we need to be able to define our terms. Some people just take that so literally, but I was, or so figuratively, uh, I actually read something today that they wanted to know the definition of for, F-O-R. <laughs> I was like, okay, I want to get a little carried away with definitions on trying to define where we are and what we're talking about. You know, the Bible, a collection of smaller books written by more than 40 different authors over a thousand years, three different languages, two parts, old and new, 66 total books. So that's our definition of the Bible. There are many people that uh, take that for granted, I guess. When you talk about the Bible, there's different Bibles that people use, and that's not the point tonight. The point is strictly our Christian, Orthodox Christianity Bible. Uh, the canon, when we talk about the New Testament canon, in the first century was speaking of a stalk, stalk. I say that almost as funny as I say other things. <laughs> or a reed, it came to be a straight mop, a rod, to define a measure of terms. Defining a measure. The Bible doesn't give us a list determined by rabbis and scholars, but ultimately God defines books during the Bible. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Around A.D. 250, scripture within the Bible is defined as any document sacred and authoritative by a religious group. So how was it decided? Which scripture, which book, which, I'm sorry, which books that actually would go into the Bible? written by an apostle, except for James and Jude, during the apostolic age, accepted by the church, and agree with each other. Scripture. Uh, they're divided into Old Testament law. History, poetry, prophecy. That's the Old Testament. The way they, the genres would be divided up. Law, history, <coughs> prophecy, and poetry. The New Testament is divided up into Gospels, History, Pauline Epistles, General Revelation, General and Revelation. Here lies part of the problem when people start reading the Bible. We can't read the Psalms as we would read the Gospels. We can't read Revelation as we read the prophecy. It's different genres. If you're looking at the book of Acts versus the book of Revelation. The genre of the book of Acts is history. It's a story. Well, the, the entire Bible is a story. Yes, I've heard that. But the point being is how we read it and how we understand it. Acts being historical, Revelation being prophet. Prophetical. Is that a word? <laughs> I don't think that's a word. Anyway, it is now. It is now. <laughs> Thank you. Today, the Old Testament uh, goes back to 2200 B.C. Uh, the Pentateuch which is the first five books of the Old Testament, 1445 to 1450 B.C., all the way to John in A.D. 100 for the book of Revelation. So the Bible was written in a long period of time, over 15, 1,600 years. Questions, answers, comments? The Jew, Jewish refers to the first five books uh, as the Torah versus the Pentateuch. The Septuagint, Greek Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. Somewhere around 81, 80 to 200, the oldest known list of New Testament books were completed. Okay. Somewhere around 81, 80 to 200, the oldest known list of New Testament books were compiled, not completed. 
discovered in the 1700s. We talked, uh, I talked to one of our guys today about how to pronounce this, Antonio Mutari, Mutari, how would you say that? M-U-T-A-R, M-U-R-A-T-O-R. Muratorian, Muratorian? I like Muratorian. Muratorian. That sounds right, yeah. Thank you, player. <laughs> <laughs> the the Muratorian canon includes all the God, the four Gospels, Acts, 13 letters of Paul, not Hebrews, Jude, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. Um, however, that was considered the canon at that, that point. He became a heretic because he believed God of Old Testament and New Testament were different. So whoever compiled these books became a heretic, whatever his name may have been. It starts with an M. Uh, Eusebius, a Roman historian, divided the books into four categories. Canical, widely accepted, rejected, and heretical in AD 325. No books initially accepted into the canon have been thrown out. What? what we decided, the New Testament and the Old Testament, the 66 books, none were ever accepted and somebody said, hey, we don't like that, we'll throw those back out. However, there are two groups of books that a lot of people feel should be in the Bible. One being the Apocrypha and the other being the Gnostic Gospels. The Apocrypha is a set of books written between the 3rd century BC and the 1st century AD. 14 books, depending on how it's divided. Uh, found several copies of Greek translations in the, uh, the Old Testament, accepted by Augustine in the 4th century, and canonized by the Catholic Church. I had someone talk to me about the Apocrypha and what's different about Catholicism and Christianity. What a sausage joke. <laughs> oh, God. Real life. Real life. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm the only viewer. Yeah. <laughs> Are you really? We have three. We had three, and then they, they all went away. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, it's John. <laughs> That's all right. That's why we're doing it, just to see. Just to see. Um, <laughs> anyway, the Catholic Church canonized the uh, Apocrypha into their Bible in 1546. It's a Council of Trent, so the Catholic Bible, which I touched on a little bit ago, and the Christian Bible are different. One case... Um, contains more books than the other. Uh, the other set of books that were not included were the Gnostic Gospels, Pseudepigrapha. Pseudepigrapha. I actually broke that down so I could never. To pronounce that one, I should have used that on the, on the other guy also. False writings written by someone else claiming to be an apostle. Gnostic Gospels. That's why, that's why they're not included. Uh, the council that formed an undisputed decision on the canon took place at Carthage in 397, which would be AD 397. However, the key to remember is that it was written by God, not a council that determined the books. This is not an all-exclusive overview of why the Bible is reliable. It's just giving you a foundational history of how we got where we're at and what, how we got the book that we have today. Can I, can I ask you a question? Always. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I was reading this, uh, you had written a blog just a few days ago about like what Christianity is and how we know it's true. I'm just glad somebody read it. I did. Um, and that was the part I found fascinating because you, you would claim that we, we have all, the, all these different books of the Bible, right? Uh, that through, you said there was four councils. What was it? Four count. There's the way one of the guys yeah. talks about it, and what I based the okay. blog on was Geisler said that there's one book, okay. two testaments, okay. 
three creeds, four counselors, 500 years. 500 years, so you've got, and, and, and this, these books are written over a 2,000, 4,000 year period? 1,500 to 2,000 years. And there's period. what, 40 authors? Very good. Okay, so you've got 40 authors written over thousands of year period, and then you have four councils where human beings go in and debate and there was, there was debates at these councils that- Yeah, because Santa Claus punched a guy, remember? <laughs> what? Anyways, there, from what I remember there was a, or from what I've heard, there, was, there wasn't just debate over which book should be in there and about, you know, like say the doctrine of the Trinity, all that stuff. There, there were, there were debates about the, whether the Trinity was biblical uh, and that sometimes even turned violent, right? These debates turned violent. So, so you had these debates about which book should be in there and tons of disagreements and over four councils they finally decide, okay, these are, the, these are finally the books that we're gonna put into the Bible. And this, is, and this is all done by men. But you're saying, no, no, it wasn't humans that did that, that chose this, even though it was humans that had the debates and, and the discussions and came to the conclusions about what should be in the Bible, even if not everyone agreed. It was God. God did all of that. God, in the end, was the one that decided what book should be in the Bible. I just, oh, totally. I, However, I don't know how you could possibly believe that. I mean, how do you even, there's, how do you even come to that conclusion when it's human beings from start to finish that did all of this and you're gonna say, well, but it wasn't humans that decided it was God. Based on what? Based on when you go back previously, uh, the books were accepted based on standards. The standards being written by apostles, uh, except for James and I think Jude was it? Uh, during the apostolic time period, there were four things that, let me check, four things, four standards for a book to be considered. <coughs> and the books were not, the councils didn't actually decide what books. The books had already been decided prior to the councils. The councils simply confirmed well, they did. The books were already accepted by the church, had been moved around, had been translated and sent from church to church, and they accepted books way before the councils. The councils just basically said, yeah, these are the ones we're going to accept. So, yeah, God did it because of the way they were written, because of the way they were passed around, the people that wrote them, and the time frame that they were written in. Does that make sense? I, I guess. I mean, but you realize that not all forms of Christianity accept the same books, right? You've you got like Eastern Orthodoxy, you've got the Catholics. I mean, there's, there's, I mean. Which would, that would be the debate right there. Right, so, 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 I mean, so if, we can't even, if we can't even agree on what books in, in modern Christianity, <coughs> based on what Orthodoxy should be in the Bible, how, how I mean, because you had said all oh, they had a standard. It was a human standard, the humans did created the standard. There, God never said this is the standard we use to decide which book to be in the Bible. Those are people that decided that standard. I, I guess what I'm trying, my point is, this is an extraordinary claim, extraordinary, that humans, even though, we're, even though they were part of every single part of the process, every single part of the process they were involved in, in putting the books together to make the Bible, you're saying, but it wasn't humans, it was God. I'm God saying, created the Bible. Of course he did. Okay. Because it's an this isn't the argument for tonight for the reliability of the text that we have okay. because that becomes the inspiration and the inerrancy argument. The only thing we're trying to do, that I would be trying to argue tonight would be for the reliability of the books we have. It comes down to, like you said, Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's why there's so many different, there'll be a debate on one of the examples you used as far as Catholics. Mm -hmm. We just talked about the Apocrypha was canonized into their Bible at the Council of Trent. So do they meet the Orthodox Christianity standard? Orthodox Christianity has a set, as Geisler said, mm -hmm. of standards established by God. Men are involved, obviously. It's the only way to come up with it. But it's a circumstantial case built on the evidence that we're building on here. This is just a foundational part of the history of it. So I mean, well, it's not the only way to come up with it. I mean, God could have literally just handed down a Bible like the the tablets of the Ten Commandments, he could have just handed us a book and said, well, here it is. And then, and then we'd know for sure that it wasn't well, humans. That but we don't know that about anything in history. That what? 
as far as knowing for sure, if you're basing it on, you're arguing that men wrote these things, well, how would we know anything historical, period, if you're basing, if that's the standard. Men wrote all history. Men wrote history? Any book that has ever been written has been written by somebody. So you're saying that if God wrote a book, there, we wouldn't we're be able not, to tell. We're strictly, we're strictly setting a standard for the reliability mm -hmm. of the historical accuracy of the Bible. Based on the same standards that you I mean, use for the history of geography, the history what, of anything else. The point I'm trying to make is you, you, can, you can point to the Bible and say that it's historically reliable and accurate. Like, what we're doing. I have no problem with that. But, but to make the claim that it is not, it was not put together by human beings, even we though they were... Made that claim. It was put together by human beings. So, so God, didn't, God didn't decide which books went in the Bible. It was human beings. We knew what books were going to be, as we said, canonized prior to the council based on, which is a different argument, but based on their use, their apostolic writings, the apostolic age, the inspiration, and these type criteria. But that's a, that doesn't have anything to do with the establishing the reliability of a historical document. Comparing the Bible to any other historical document has no bearing on whether it's inspired or it's without error. I, mean, I would agree with that. That's all we're doing. Once you establish that, then you can move on to establish inerrancy and inerrancy and inspiration. So so your claim is that if you if you can prove that the Bible the, the Bible, the books in the Bible are historically accurate, right? Then you can then retroactively go back and say, therefore, it must have been inspired by God. And there's more to it than that, but okay. in, 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 to make it simple, sure. Okay. Move on. <laughs> yeah, sorry to interrupt you. No, not at all. That's what we're. I mean, that's uh, that's quite a claim, but you know what I mean. Which one? That we can say the Bible was inspired? <laughs> no, no, that, that God decided which books are, were in the Bible. It wasn't humans that did it. It was God. God made the Bible. Ultimately, mm. humans decided the books that would be canonized. Mm. But just as the writers of the books were inspired writers, mm. they weren't just guys hanging out making... I mean, they were inspired also. I mean, but it, that's not the point of what It, it seems to me that you're... You're taking away free will. What, uh, maybe you're, I know, I guess you're a Calvinist. So maybe you don't care about that. <laughs> <It's a low. laughs> yeah. Take yeah. away free will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, keep going. Yeah. Uh, where were we? Uh, just after the apocrypha. Uh, right. The uh, as far as the Old Testament goes, well, yeah, that's all right. We'll pick up there. Most of the Old Testament was burned by custom. Uh, only a few manuscripts from 10th century to the present when it was accepted in AD 250. However, comma, we have, we made a discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 1945 to 1946, we have 95% uh, of the text identical to the Hebrew Bible. Every book of the Old Testament except Esther, 1600 years before our manuscripts were written. So as far as the Old Testament goes, I mean, oh my goodness. What more of evidence can you have as far as the reliability of that goes? It hasn't changed in over 2,000 years. So, the Old Testament is reliable just as any other historical document. The New Testament, we have over 5,500, probably more than that now from since I even wrote this outline. The manuscripts of the New Testament, that means we have no originals. We have no originals of any of it, but we have manuscripts. And when you look back at history and you look at the way they compare any others, any other historical writing, uh, the New Testament and the Bible as a whole, has the New Testament has more copies than any other historical document ever written. So who cares how many copies we have? Well, <laughs> that's a good, a good indication that it's reliable. That in itself, just by the number of copies. But... Second, third century, they were dating from the second or third century within 70 years, not including the 8,000 copies of the Latin Vulgate, more than 10,000 copies of our earlier versions, 
there's so many copies, and if you start comparing it to, say, Homer and the, how do we pronounce the Iliad? Yeah. Iliad? Sounds good. Uh, 643 copies, comparatively speaking. And we accept that as a story. Julius Caesar and Gallic Wars, we have 10 copies. A thousand years after it was written, we accept that. Plato, 1,200 years after it was written, we have seven copies. Aristotle, 1,200 years versus in 10 copies. I mean, you see the difference of why would we think the New Testament is reliable as a, as a historical document. You can look at the manuscripts alone and come up with, gee, if we believe this, why shouldn't we believe that? I'm not saying there's not objections to that, but that's the first point to establish the reliability. We have 100% of the New Testament, and we're sure of, based on this evidence, 99.5% of it coming from without any of the manuscripts, any of that. We can verify 99.5% of that based on other writers, early church fathers um, from the second and third centuries, only 11 verses are missing, mostly from second and third John. So when you're looking at how accurate, how reliable is the New Testament, you're looking at pretty tough, 99.5%, and that's without any of the manuscripts. I think I'll go away. Archaeologically, in the Old Testament, uh, yeah, Hittites, we mentioned 47 times. Uh, we have 10,000 clay tablets confirming the existence. In Israel, King David has confirmed the city gate of Laish, through which Abram passed in Genesis 14, and the high place of king found in the uh, Tel Dan, to name a few of the archaeological pieces of evidence that we have. I mean, it's, there's so much evidence for the old and new, it's hard not to argue for the historical accuracy. In the New Testament, we have descriptions from Pilate, Herod the Great, and uh, another high priest, including the burial of boxes of Herod and somebody. Plus many new texts found throughout when the Bible, where the Bible references them. We've got so much archeological evidence, and manuscript evidence, there's no reason again. I mean, I can't emphasize this. When somebody asks you why you believe the Bible, oh my goodness. Now when you start getting, as we talked about earlier, into inspiration and inerrancy, that's a different argument. When you talk to somebody, establish the historical reliability and build on that. Uh, there's been over 300 prophecies fulfilled. 300. That's, there's nothing comparable. So close to original, every confidence it teaches the truth. So, here's what I would do. If somebody tells you that, you, why do you believe the Bible, and you know where I'm going with this, you I've heard this a hundred times. Why would you believe the Bible? Well, instead of just saying, I feel it in my heart, or, because everybody has a book. Every religion has a book. Uh, or saying that, well, Jesus told me, or whatever answer you want to give to them, and they tell you, well, just a bunch of myths, fables, or whatever, Tell them, look, no, I believe it based on the evidence. Okay, what's the evidence? Well, there's two ways, but I'm only going to give you one for time reasons. And I refer to it as maps. Maps. Although in West Virginia, we should refer to it as spam. It's called maps. <laughs> Why spam? Watch West Virginia stack, bro. <laughs> oh, my wife told me not to be comedic. <laughs> I'm, ending. I'm ending, so I could be that. I can throw the comedic part out there. Anyway, maps, manuscripts, we talked about. We have more manuscripts than any other historical document. Archaeology, we talked about. We have archaeological evidence. Prophecy, over 300 prophecies fulfilled. And secular sources. We have enough secular sources to confirm pretty much anything that's been written in there. We already just talked about with zero manuscripts. Church Father writings that we have 99.5%. So, somebody next time somebody asks you, 
Remember spam or maps. Questions, answers, comments? Keep going, man. You're on a roll. <laughs> I've said that about a hundred times, so I'm done. If you joined us, thank you. Woo! <laughs>